Okay, let's uh, start with our Midrash, the voice that speaks in the desert. Blessed are you, Lord our God, King of the universe, who has sanctified us with his commandment and has commanded us to be engaged with the words of Torah. O Lord our God, we ask that you make the words of your Torah sweet in our mouth and in the mouths of the entire people of the greater house of Israel. May we, our descendant and the descendant of your people of the greater house of Israel, know your name and study your Torah for its own sake. Blessed are you, O Lord, who teaches Torah to his people. Blessed are you, O Lord, our God, King of the universe, who chose us from all people to give us his Torah. Blessed are you, O Lord, giver of the Torah. So, Parasha Yitro, the voice that speaks in the desert. So, come on. Okay. Ah, okay. In Exodus 3, we read, Now Moshe was standing the sheep of Yitro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian. Leading the flock to the far side of the desert, he came to the mountain of God, to Horeb. The angel of Adonai appeared to him in a fire blazing from the middle of a bush. He looked and saw that although the bush was flaming with fire, yet the bush was not being burnt up. Moshe said, I'm going to go over and see this amazing sight and find out why the bush isn't being burnt up. When Adonai saw that he had gone over to see, God called him from the middle of the bush. Moshe, Moshe, he answered, here I am. He said, don't come any closer. Take your sandals off your feet because the place where you are standing is holy ground. I am the God of your father, he continued, the God of Abraham, the God of Yitzhak, the God of Yaakov. Moshe covered his face. He was afraid to look at God. Moshe. Moshe, the discouraged man. Moshe, the man who fell from the top to the bottom of Egyptian society just because of one choice. The choice of compassion for humankind in associating with Hashem's people. Moshe, the discouraged man who when he tried to make a difference in the world, found himself in a place of total incapacity to do anything. Anything of his own self, that is. Because he found himself actually doing the very thing that Hashem wanted him to do. And that was to go to a quiet place in the Arabian desert to hear his voice. Oh. Okay, yes. Here's for a little rabbi trail. The word desert in Hebrew is the same as the word to speak. Because in the desert, whether it is the desert of a troubled life where nothing seems right, or whether it is a geographical, biological desert, the desert is the place where things are so quiet that we can hear God speak. You see the words on the slide, uh, the first one, desert, is, re is read 
is for those who've done Hebrew with me, Mem, Dalet, Bet, Resh, and you read it Midbar. Can you say Midbar? Midbar. It's actually, you know, you know, the fourth book of the Torah is called Ba Midbar. It means in the desert or the wilderness. <coughs> That's fine. You know, Midbar. And the word under is also Mem, Dalet, Bet, Resh, where you read it Medaber. Some of you have done a bit of Hebrew. Say, Ani medaber ivrit. I speak oh, Hebrew. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, Where so. Uh, well, I'm. Can they understand? Okay. <laughs> so, um, so this is this is interesting, you know, because the desert is actually the place where God spoke to His people. So for 40 years, what was Moshe doing? He was actually learning to hear God speak. You know, it's like very often maybe God tells us, hey, you're going to do this. He said, okay, God, I got it from here. But actually, no. When we know his plan, we've got to continue listening to his... Uh, when we know his will, we've got to listen to the plan on how his will is fulfilled. So this is what Moshe was doing. Except for special times of judgment, I for one think that God is a gentleman. He doesn't usually force himself on people. He leads us gently to the place where we ought to go to listen to him. And sometimes like, Moshe, maybe he felt, what am I doing? I'm, I'm supposed to be freeing the people. Look, I'm in the desert. I can't even go back to Egypt. But actually, God was leading him to a certain place, mostly a spiritual place. And this is, I think, what he does. We, we've got to look at what he let happens to our lives as God leading us. You know, we have this dog called Jack. Some of you knew him, right? An Australian shepherd. And uh, one time we were visiting friends at a campground and we were sitting on the log talking with a brother while he was watching his two young children playing by what looked like a trail leading somewhere. And we were watching and everything. And as we were talking, we noticed that Jack was pacing back and forth at the entrance of the trail thus ensuring the children would not go down it. You know, so in this way, without attacking, without barking, Jack was shepherding the children to stay in the place where they ought to stay. Or so it looked like, you know, and I think Hashem does the same thing. He opens doors, close other ones, lets this happen so that we seem to go, na, 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 and we don't know. We end up to the, in the place where we're supposed to be. And sometimes we don't know. Sometimes we feel, what am I doing here? What's going on? Everything's going wrong. But actually, we're exactly in the place where he wants us to be. He creates or allows situations that make us remain in certain areas or go to other areas all in order to fulfill his will that sometimes we don't know. And like I said last week, sometimes the shortest place from A to B is not a straight line. You know, you, you know, especially when God's will is involved. So basically, we get there to his will, to the place of his will, subconsciously following the lead he, of where he has his be at the moment. But that system doesn't work when we have a rebellious attitude bent on doing our own thing. Sometimes we want to push our way through or we rebel against what he does. And then we find ourselves in a mess and then we want to pray, say, God, help me. So, well, I didn't be there, you know. So, you know, it is the meek and humble in spirit 
who inherit the earth. It is the simple that, simple that are blessed, not the proud, the rebellious and arrogant, who often fall into a ditch they dug themselves. We all want to be humble, but we don't want to be humbled. <laughs> to be humble, we have to be humbled. And what are the things that humble us? Disappointments, failures, weaknesses, injustice, all these things humble us. But humility is the state we must be in in order to hear his voice and receive his blessing. It is the pure in heart who see Hashem. It is the meek who inherit the earth. It is those who mourn, who hear, it, who hear his tender voice of comfort. Moshe, the broken man who lost everything, sees something strange on the mountain. I don't think it was just an inquisitive sense that made him go up to look at what was happening. But something that I feel he learned while watching sheep. A shepherd has to be on guard. He has to be intuitive as to attacks from other shepherds and predators. He can't take anything for granted. And I think it's that sense that made him go check that strange bush. You know, sometimes in life, sometimes we can be so uh, focused on what we want to do, on what we think we ought to do, that we, we push away that little voice that sometimes tells us, hey, look over there, talk to that person, you know, or something. But uh, as a shepherd, I think that Moshe is learned to listen to these little, should I say the word, checks from Hashem, intuitions, there's little nudges, there's little nudges. I think it's that sort of sense that made him want to go check uh, that strange bush. Having spent 40 years away from the, from, from the business of Egyptian cities, he for 40 years he was in the quiet, in a quiet reflection, in a quiet place. And that's important. And because he was there, he learned to hear the voice of God. His response to his life's experience made him become sensitive to the voice that speaks in the desert, the voice that speaks in whatever desert that we go through. And that story of Moses should speak to us. We all have our own deserts. And our response to the deserts that Hashem allows in our lives should also make us sensitive to the voice that speaks in the desert. So we'll get back to Hashem's voice. Hello, slide. Ah, thank you. I needed to say please. The voice of Hashem. The voice that speaks in the desert is powerful. It is especially powerful when it calls our name. You know, it calls Moses, Moses. Said Moshe, I think. When the voice that speaks in the desert calls our name, 
everything is different. The voice that speaks in the desert doesn't fill us with pride while endorsing our own agenda. But when the voice that speaks in the desert calls our name, we see ourselves in a different way. In silent quietness, the voice that speak in the desert dominate the voice and the noise of all other voices. It is the voice that gives logic and reason to Hashem's impossibly right choices over all the insanity of this world's natural wrong choices. Moshe, the broken man who heard the voice from a fire in a bush, unconsumed by its fiery host, became the man who led a whole nation through the sea on dry land. Forty years later, Joshua, Moshe's disciple, led that very same nation through the Jordan River as on dry land. In our text this week, we read how after being the mediator between Hashem and the people, Moshe wants the people to hear Hashem for themselves. To hear the very voice of Hashem is an awesome experience. The prophets who actually did interact with it <clears throat> describe it as a great voice like thunder, like a rush of many waters, like the great sound of a trumpet. Elijah also describes it as a still small voice. But whatever it is, the people who interacted with that voice all had a reaction of respectful fear. Some just prostrated on the ground. Some were even sick for days in the Brit. When some people realized who Yeshua was, they either prostrated themselves or they didn't want him around. We have this example of uh, Peter, who when he realized in front of who he was, he said, he, he fell at Yeshua's knees and said, get away from me, sir, I'm a sinner. The text says this week, Adonai says to Moshe, see, I'm coming to you in a thick cloud so that the people will be able to hear when I speak with you and also to trust in you forever. Moshe had told Adonai what the people had said. So Adonai said to Moshe, go to the people today and tomorrow, Se separate them for me by having them wash their clothing, prepare for the third day. For on the third day, Adonai will come down on Mount Sinai before the eyes of all the people. You are to set limits for the people all around and say, be careful not to go up on the mountain or even touch its base. Whoever touches the mountain will surely be put to death. No hand is to touch him, for he must be stoned or shot by arrows. Neither animal or no human will be allowed to live. When the shofar sounds, they may go up the mountain. Moshe went down from the mountain to the people and separated the people for God. They washed their clothing and he said to the people, prepare for the third day, don't approach a woman. On the morning of the third day, there was thunder, lightning and a thick cloud on the mountain. Then the shofar blast sounded so loudly that all the people in the camp trembled. Moshe brought the people out of the camp to meet God. They stood near the base of the mountain. Mount Sinai was enveloped in smoke because Adonai descended onto it in fire. Its smoke went up like the smoke from a furnace and the whole mountain shook violently. As the sound of the shofar grew louder and louder, Moshe spoke and God answered him with a voice. Adonai came down onto Mount Sinai to the top of the mountain. Then Adonai called Moshe to the top of the mountain and Moshe went up. Adonai said to Moshe, go down and warn the people 
not to force their way to, through to Adonai to see him. If they do, many of them will perish. Even the Kohanim who are allowed to approach Adonai must keep themselves holy. Otherwise, Adonai may break out against them. You know, when we do a Torah service like we're going to do next week, the Torah service really is supposed to, to represent a microcosm of what happened at Mount Sinai. This is why we start with what Moshe used to say, you know, and we end with what Moshe used to say. It's supposed to represent that. So we also lift it up, you know. So we repeat the same thing that happened at Mount Horeb. So think about it next week when, uh, when uh, we have service. Some synagogues, uh, is this Psalm 29? Yes. Some synagogues at the end of service, they read Psalm 29, which is awesome. It says, give Adonai his due, you who are godly. Give Adonai his due of glory and strength. Give, give Adonai the glory due to his name. Worship Adonai in holy splendor. The voice of Adonai is over the waters. The God of glory thunders. Adonai over rushing waters. The voice of Adonai in power. The voice of Adonai in splendor. The voice of Adonai cracks the cedars. Adonai splinters the cedars of the Lebanon and make the Lebanon skip like a calf. Syrian like a wild ox. The voice of Adonai flashes fiery flames. The voice of Adonai rocks the desert. Adonai convulses the Kadesh desert. The voice of Adonai causes deer to give birth and strips the forest bare. Once in his temple, all cry, glory! Adonai sits enthroned above the flood. Adonai sits enthroned as king forever. May Adonai give strength to his people. May Adonai bless his people with his shalom. What a depiction of the voice that speaks in the desert. Somehow, Elijah, the decapitating fire and brimstone prophet, needed, needed to learn a different side of the voice of Hashem. So he went to the desert to hear it. He went to Mount Horeb. You know, it's funny, they, yeah, he went to Mount Horeb. And here, what it says, and we read it some already. Okay. Uh, there he went to a cave and spent the night. Then the word of Adonai came to him and he said to him, What are you doing here, Eliyahu? He answered, I have been very zealous for Adonai, the God of armies. Because the people of Israel have abandoned your covenant, broken down your altars, killed your prophets with the sword. Now, I'm the only one left, and they're coming after me to kill me too. He said, go outside, stand on the mountain before Adonai. And right there and then, Adonai went past. A mighty blast of wind tore the mountains apart and broke the rocks in pieces before Adonai. But Adonai was not in the wind. After the wind came an earthquake, but Adonai was not in the earthquake. After the, earth, the earthquake, fire broke out, but Adonai was not in the fire. And after the fire came, the fire came a quiet, subdued voice. When Eliyahu heard it, he covered his face with his cloak, stepped out and stood at the entrance up to the cave. Then a voice came to him and said, What are you doing here, Eliyahu? And as he did with Moshe, Hashem passed by in front of Elijah. And as he did with Moshe on the mountain, Hashem showed Elijah the earthquake, the wind, the fire, but he also showed him that these were only the result of the still, small, subdued voice of Hashem. Earthquake, fire, no, that's the result of his still, small voice. Can you imagine if he screamed? In all these things though, in all the reactions of the prophet who heard the voice that speaks in the desert, 
This voice provoked respect and awe. It never was a cavalier event. Oh, God talked to me last night. No. Actually, Judaism actually believes that it's a very rare thing when Hashem spoke, speaks directly with people. Judaism says that when people hear the voice, because we all hear the voice inside, it's called, like I told the children, the bad call. It's like an echo. It's like an echo, because like the children of Israel in the desert, we couldn't stand hearing that voice that cracks buildings, you know. So, we can't hear the voice. We would say, don't talk to us, you know. Uh, like they told Moshe, don't, don't let him talk to us. He talks to you. And in a certain way, we do the same thing through Yeshua. You know, he, he talks to us, he teaches us, you know. So it's like just Yeshua is a bit like the bad call. He tells us what the Father says in a way that we can understand. We can't relate, we can relate to him and he can relate to us. And to hear that voice is very important. Daniel, the prophet, say that at the time of the end, the people who know their God will stand firm and prevail. Time of the end is, is if we know our God, we stand firm and prevail. Some translations say, we do exploit. It's really important. He says, those among the people who have discernment will cause the rest of the people to understand what is happening. So what we're learning every week in congregation, what we're learning uh, at Torah Club, what we're learning as we learn to, to hear that voice in our everyday life, is really important to learn to be sensitive um, um, like for example you want to say something and you feel hmm, maybe i shouldn't say that lesson learned check you know I'm going to do something and say well well i leave it rest maybe I'm not sure that check you know, that's really the training you know or somebody tells you something and you want to react like Whoa. I said uh, maybe not you know, check learn something we learn these lessons we learn these lessons and it's very important the people who know they are God will stand firm and prevail. Those among the people who have discernment, knowing the right and the wrong, the clean and the unclean, the pure and the impure, the correct and the incorrect, will cause the rest of the people to understand what is happening. Uh, and for that to happen, we need to constantly be listening to the bad call. Joel, the prophet, also said, after this, I will pour my spirit on all humanity. That was an end time verse. That's the verse that Peter used to describe what happened on Acts 2. You know, when you have the wind and the tongues of fire. Acts 2 is the day of Pentecost when they actually celebrate the giving of the Torah on Mount Sinai. You know, when tongues of fire came on Mount Sinai, tongues of fire comes on the disciple, earthquake and wind. It was a, a, a little Mount Sinai thing. They were probably talking about it, reading about it. That's what you do at Pentecost. And all of a sudden it's happening. It's a whoa. You know, so, and when they went out, people said, oh, these people are drunk. He says, no, 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 no. It's too early in the morning. You know, but he says, here's what's happening. It's a fulfillment of what the prophet Joel said. 
after this, I will pour out my spirit on all humanity. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your old men will dream dreams. Your young men will see visions. And also on male and female slaves in those days, I will pour out my spirit. God's spirit will go on non-Jews and, and the common people. You know, but of course, again, it's like, I can say, hey, you guys, you know, I'm going to have you all play guitar. So in order for you all to play guitar, I'm going to go to the guitar center and buy 50 guitars and give you all a guitar. Will that make you play guitar? No, you need to learn to play the guitar. <laughs> you know, so, so, and so we have these promises, you know, these verses, we have these promises. So all that is needed, needed now is that we allow Hashem to put our heart in the right place. All that is needed is that we allow Hashem to work in us in order to make us what He wants us to be. Not what we are, but what He wants us to be. So all our actions, so all our actions and motivations are motivated with the fulfillment of Torah instructions. We want to obey. Obedience takes humility. Because when our actions are motivated through the fulfillment of Torah instructions, we place ourselves in a position to hear the voice that speaks in the desert. And we say, well, I want to do with the Torah. So how would the Torah have me react? And when we talk Torah, you know, it's a, the Torah as Yeshua teaches it to us. You know, Yeshua teaches us how to apply the Torah, how to apply it to everyday life. You know, so how 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 do I apply it? When when we when we set our hearts that I want to do it Yeshua's way, I want to follow the Torah and I want to follow Yeshua. When we do that, we place our hearts in a position to hear the voice that speaks in the desert. It's really very simple. It's very simple. We place ourselves in a position to hear the bad call. Our spirit must be in the right place. The heart of the proud is full of his own way, because there is no room in his heart for Hashem. He's full of himself. So we must allow Hashem to work that humility into us. And sometimes it feels like we are under the chisel of his trying to sculpt us into the image of his son. You know, sometimes, oh, oh gosh, you know, right? Life, right? So here's another little rabbi trick. Okay, and if you can see, I have somebody with a chisel. Um, I'd like to take you into the Florentine world of sculpture. Here we go. Um, this is a statue of David, the biblical hero who slayed the giant Goliath. The statue had been ordered to be made in 1464. This commission went to Agostino, he was a sculptor and a huge slab of marble was extracted from the Carrara quarries in Tuscany, Italy, for the project. For unknown reasons, Agostino abandoned the project after doing only a little work, mostly roughing out around the legs. Later, another sculptor, Antonio Rossellino, was hired to take over the project, and that was in 1476. But he backed out almost immediately, citing the poor quality of the marble. Modern scientific analysis of the marble have confirmed that it is indeed a marble of mediocre quality. So it was left without a sculpture, but still too expensive to throw away. So the massive slab a slab of marble set out in the element for a quarter century. In the summer of 1501, a new effort was made to find a sculptor who could finish the statue. 
The 26-year-old the sculptor Michelangelo was chosen and given two years to complete it. Early in the morning of September 13, 1501, from the stone, the stone that had been rejected by other sculptures, the young artist got to work on the, on the slab, the rejected slab. With a supernatural sense of mission, he extracted from the discarded rock the figure of the famous king who had previously been discarded by his father and brothers and whose life inspired the psalmist to write of the rejected Messiah that would come out from his loins. The, so, the stone which the builders rejected became the cornerstone. Another artist whose name and writer, Giorgio Vasari, would later describe Michelangelo's work as the bringing back to life of one who was dead. So this is from, uh, with a little bit of my own writing, but this story comes from Britannica, Encyclopedia. So may we, may we, we who may have been discarded by others, not resist when the master sculptor applies his ever gentle but firm chisel on our lives to make us conform to he who, though rejected by the world, rose from the dead. But back to our bad call. Many people want to hear Hashem, they want to hear the bad call. The Torah tells us some, how some people heard it. Some people heard through earthquakes, waters, fire, wind, donkeys, angels. But as terrible as the voice of Hashem sounded on Mount Horeb, the writer of the letter to the Hebrews tells us that it was nothing compared to what is to be. Uh, the letter to the Hebrews is a pep talk to the despondent, discouraged believers of first century Israel. He he tried to 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 tell them, uh, you, yeah, you're rejected from the temple, from this earthly high priest, but you have a better high priest than Yeshua. You have. Uh, he tried to show them that what they had in in them. Messianic Judaism faith was much greater than anything else. And he does the same thing with Mount Horeb, what happened in Mount Horeb. As terrible as it, were, as it was, he says, for you have not come to a tangible mountain, to an ignited fire, to darkness, to murk, to a whirlwind, to the sound of a shofar, and to a voice whose words made the hearers beg that no further message be given to them. For they couldn't bear what was being commanded them. If even an animal touches the mountain, it is to be stoned to death. And so terrifying was the sight that Moshe said, I'm quaking with dread. On the contrary, you have come to Mount Zion. You thought that was terrible? Whoa, you have come to Mount Zion. That is, to the city of the living God, heavenly Yerushalayim, to myriads of angels in festive assembly, to a community of the firstborn whose names have been recorded in heaven, to a judge who is God of everyone, to spirits of righteous people who have been brought to the goal, to the mediator of a new covenant, Yeshua, and to the sprinkled blood that speaks better things than that of Abel. One thing is sure, is that to hear the voice of Hashem, to hear the voice that speaks in the desert, when we do hear it, it never leaves us the same. It affects us. It changes us. It reproves us, it cleanses us, 
it remakes us. The voice that speaks in the desert is powerful. And it is especially powerful when it calls our name. When the voice that speaks in the desert calls our name, everything is different. The voice that speaks in the desert doesn't fill us with pride while endorsing our own agenda. But when the voice that speaks in the desert calls our name, we see ourselves in a different way. In silent quietness, the voice that speaks in the desert dominates the noise of all other voices. It is the voice that's, uh, let me play that thing. It is the voice that gives logic and reason to Hashem's impossible right choices over the insanity of this world's natural wrong choices. Uh, I like to we'll play uh, a video of a song called The Voice of God. I want to put the CCs. Did you play it from the YouTube or from the... From the YouTube you can have the CCs. You showed this before, didn't you? Oh, two or three years ago. Yeah, but I think she remembers it. I can translate it if you need to. I can just translate, honey.
get the least out of the jets, hang on to my second. You may get into a second.
That was beautifully said. So let's pray. Abba Father, we thank you. Um, we thank you that we have uh, the option, possibility to hear the bad call, to hear uh, your voice, to know what it tells us. Even if you, if we never hear another thing, we have all the written word to tell us what we should do. Help us to, to be faithful, uh, to follow the gentle nudges of your spirit and of your voice in our lives. Help us to know that as we do, we'll always end up in the place, in the right place of your choice. And when that time comes in the end, we'll be able to be strong and do exploit. Amen.